each other for many years and tell us, bring us, give us a detailed accounting of your garden. How's it doing? Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, it's true. I, uh, I think I first went up to some of your classes maybe 25 years ago now up at Johnson State. And, Armed with uh, a lot of uh, gourds. You, you still yeah, call them gourds? Gourds and squashes. I used to bring you delicata squash a lot because uh, it was fall, and uh, those are a sweet one. Uh, our squash crop is pretty good. Uh, they were on some of our heavier soils, so even though we suffered a drought uh, quite a bit of this season, uh, they're coming in okay, along with our butternut and our acorn and our other winter squash. Spaghetti are already harvested. Um, other crops struggled. We had smaller corn than usual because we just don't have enough water in our ponds to irrigate the corn as much as it would need. Um, and, we, and we rotate our irrigation just to keep things alive, actually. Uh, but we had uh, sweet potatoes are decent, a little small. Uh, broccoli's been pretty bad, uh, but our cabbage is coming in pretty good right now, and our carrots are looking pretty tasty. And, um, you know, we grow a lot of different crops, and every year is a little different. This year's drought, last year's heavy rains. Uh, we're not seeing the normal weather we used to see in Vermont. What's the best crop it's doing for you right now, and how do you market your, what you grow? The very best crop, I don't know that I can name a very best crop. Uh, the tomatoes did pretty well in the high tunnels this year. Uh, the warmth was good for them. And we mostly market our product through our CSA system, which now is a credit system where people uh, pre-buy and they get extra credit for their money. And they can pick what they want whenever they want at any of our pickup sites. So it's a much more flexible CSA than a drop box or a prescribed CSA model. How many pickup sites do you have? We have uh, four scattered about Chittenden County during the week, and then we have one uh, at the farmer's market on Saturday. So people can go to any of five spots from Hinesburg to South Burlington to Williston to Burlington twice. Can you take a, a guess at the kind of revenue you might get from year to year? Um, yeah, you know, it, it uh, covers the bills. Um, you know, the gross is, is a few hundred thousand dollars, but we've got 12 employees uh, full-time through the full summer and then a bit fewer in the fall. There's all kinds of mortgage. Our electric bill is almost 600 to a thousand dollars a month. Uh, so gross and net are very different things. And so people often see to hear that big number of a few hundred thousand, but, uh, you know, we usually make between 10 to 30, 35,000 dollars a year. What are you growing recently that you've, you've introduced recently? Well, husk cherries are new to a lot of people. We give out samples at the farmer's market. They're a little, uh, they look like mini tomatillos, but they're just a little uh, fruit that's in a little paper wrapper. Um, it tastes a lot like uh, sort of a, a pineapple-y uh, sweet tomato flavor. It's very hard to explain, but well, it just pops grows, in your mouth. My son grows tomatillos. Oh, tomatillo, absolutely, which is a very different flavor. We grow those for, um, and people buy those to make that green salsa you get it at some restaurants. That's the main ingredient for those. Uh, so those are some of the newer things. Uh, we've got great sweet peppers, you know, orange and yellow and, and red sweet peppers, which are always fun for a few weeks. We had a pretty good watermelon year. Do you have any hot, hot peppers? We used to grow a lot of hot peppers, and no one wanted them 15, 18 <laughs> years ago. So we stopped growing them. Now everybody wants them. So sometimes you grow what uh, is in, in the fad, and sometimes you don't. So we're not as much on the hot pepper scene. Uh, but our, our meat has been selling a lot more in this new CSA model. And we raise uh, organic pigs, and we raise organic chickens. Uh, and folks have really been enjoying the sausages that my wife makes at the uh, Mad River Food Hub, where she makes up some of the flavors herself. So we have a, a ginger uh, garlic, uh, sorry, a ginger sausage, and we have a, a um, garlic basil sausage Aww. that are both really popular. How do you market all these remarkable things that you do? Mostly uh, through our CSA and the farmer's market. That's about three quarters of our sales. And then we wholesale some product. Um, in fact, I have some in my car that I'm going to deliver after this show uh, down to Woodbelly Pizza right here in Montpelier. Um, but we wholesale about 25%. Yeah. Sophie's got an incredible uh, garden. I, I cannot oh, match maybe, maybe she'd want to talk a little bit about, bit about that. Well, when, more people that have their own gardens, the better. We've had some CSA members say, you've turned me on to fresh vegetables and I'm going to start my own garden, so I'm not coming back next year. And we say, that's the best reason we could ever possibly be here. We want more people <laughs> out there growing their own food. If they have the land, not everybody does, or garden space with the right sun. But if you have it, it's, um, it's so wonderful to grow your own food, go out and pick it just before you're going to eat it for dinner or lunch. And it's, um, it's really meditative. It's actually a great balance for me with the politics uh, to be able to get out there and have a little more quiet time uh, being productive, getting work done, but um, 
really just having the, the sounds of the wind or the birds or whatever happens to be going on around the farm. So what do you uh, grow that's most surprising to you? There must be some have come along better than you thought. Uh, there's nothing that's been particularly surprising. And this year it's been a little bit more not as good as we would hope than as good just because of that drought. But mostly with our own irrigation, we were able to keep most crops up to up to par. And uh, so nothing's been surprisingly good and bountiful this year, but a lot of things have held their own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bill and I um, got Brussels sprouts going this year. Oh, good. We've stopped growing them this year. They are so beautiful. Oh, fantastic. It's amazing. Yep. And uh, then we did a pumpkin patch, too, which nice. is just, it's gone bonkers. Yep. Yeah, we, our pumpkins are ready, which is a little early, and it's already still warm. Yeah. So we've been harvesting those to make sure there's not too much rot in the stems from powdery mildew. Uh, and we'll be giving those out to our members the next two weeks as sort of their bonus item. Uh, but we also um, work with the school and almost donate. We don't quite donate. We take 20% just to cover some of the costs, yeah. um, or maybe it's 25%. My spouse arranges this. But uh, we raise, by selling those at the school, over $1,000 a year for the PTO at the local school. Oh, so that's so we've fun. We've been doing that for about four or five years. That's oh. been a lot of fun. Want to talk about the weight of your largest pumpkin? Well, I haven't weighed them this year. Uh, past years, we've had some that are, you know, 30, 40 pounds. We don't do the monster pumpkins with the milk and the IV and all that, but just in our own patch, we get some that are 25, 35 pounds in, in good years. This year, I don't think they're quite that big. Do you have a lot of pie pumpkins? We do, yep. We've got five uh, 20 bushel bins of pie pumpkins, you know, those apple bins you see. Mm -hmm. We fill those with our winter squash. We have five of those full of pie pumpkins that we sell and do you uh, do throughout carving? the fall and winter. Carving pumpkins too? Yeah, or? those are the ones that we give to our members and, oh, and give to the school to sell. Or, oh. um, and that's, uh, we do, I don't know, I think we've got 12 or 14 bins full of those. Yeah. So how many yeah. acres do you have? Uh, well, we raise about 22 to 23 acres of vegetables. And we raise about 30 to 50 hogs to slaughter each year. And we raise and slaughter about 750 meat birds every year. And we've got another 25 layers. Uh, so we've got quite a bit going on. We've got some cats in the barns to help with <laughs> critters. So we've got about eight or nine cats now. You slaughter them yourself? The chickens we do, okay. yeah. The pigs we take to different slaughterhouses right. throughout the state, mm -hmm. depending on scheduling. So, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's turned into quite a industry, I think. A yeah, lot there's a lot of great slaughterhouses. It's tricky. Uh, you know, we because we're a premium organic product that already costs a lot to raise, they're gonna cost a lot to buy the meat. Um, sometimes the cuts don't always come back quite as, uh, as presentation-like as we would like <laughs> um, for some of the customers that are gonna pay that kind of money for them. So we have had some challenges at some slaughterhouses, but there's some that do a really great job. Yeah, Sophie and I both have gardens, but uh, talk about your garden. Uh, how many acres are involved? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we do about 22 to 23 acres uh, in vegetables. We do another 20 to 23 acres in cover crops. So we raise crops to feed the soil for the next year's crops. So we rotate between where we're growing vegetables and where we're growing cover crops. And sometimes we run our chickens over the cover crops, over the clover in particular. They really like the clover. Oh. And so they eat the clover and that um, helps their diet and, and makes them into a richer uh, chicken. And it's then really we great. get the nitrogen. Yep. Yeah, we get the nitrogen, goes <laughs> back into their roots, and so it works out really well. Um, have you had, have you yeah. had good luck with crop rotation? Um, generally, yes, I'm lucky. I have a little more soil, so I have um, uh, a better opportunity to rotate my crops than some other farms. But I'm still facing challenges from Swede midge, which affects the whole coal crop family. So oh. broccoli, uh, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, Kales, uh, we have to rotate those almost 2,000 feet In from each distance. other every year. Oh my gosh. Uh, and and we can't you? quite do that. So we, we end up with Swede midge uh, every year, which is a problem now. What can, you, can these vegetables do to each other that, that adversely? Mm. Not too much. There's some diseases that one crop could get that might affect another crop. So we try to rotate at least three years before we grow the same families of crops in the same soil, and if I can go four or five years, I try to do that so that the, um, the diseases that might be present on the, on the detritus, on the leftover plant material, uh, can be broken down and, and, the, and the diseases die out. Maybe that's where your chili peppers are gonna come back in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe, that's right, that's right. So for your property, 
um, I read in the paper the other day about your solar project. Maybe online. I posted on Facebook. Maybe. Oh, it might have been online. Yeah, yeah. It probably was online. And um, is that going to be pig housing? Is it going to be garden storage? Yeah. Is it going to be just a well, tool shed? When, well, we built a pavilion, so it's just posts with a roof okay. um, last fall. And it's right at the base of a hillside. So we're hoping to have events there someday. Oh. We do our CSA pickup right now once a week under there. Sometimes we park trucks and other implements under there in the rain. Um, but it's a, a 30 by 50 foot structure, so we're pretty excited for farm events, pig roasts, music maybe someday. Uh, it's hard to schedule everything with my spouse having Lyme disease, with our having a 12 year old, with my engagement in the political arena, with running a farm and all the different kinds of animals. <laughs> Trying to put on events is Play yet another party. thing. Come yeah, on. let's have a party. But, um, <laughs> but we, we very excitedly uh, posted on Facebook a couple days ago that uh, we just put 64 solar panels on the roof. That's um, over 18,000 watts of power. That's huge. Uh, which is quite large, but it's uh, still less power than our farm uses. So we're trying to offset what our farm uses. We're trying to invest what we can, but that was all that we could afford for now. Um, but, excuse me, I'm working hard. But our, <laughs> our power bill is uh, you know, 600 to $1,000 a month to That's keep produce um, a lot. You know, chilled down and keep our meat frozen and uh, processed food in our wash station. And so um, that's going to offset a lot of that power, but we still need to do more. And this is the first um, alternative energy project that your farm um, has worked on? Or? Well, in a way, I mean, we've heated our built? home uh, and our hot water with wood. Mm -hmm. um, so that's renewable energy because it's not fossil fuel. Right. And we harvest the wood typically from our own land and we go through four to six cords a year and we have a a uh, high efficiency wood boiler and a water storage thermal tank so I can run it for about five to seven hours every other day in the winter and the stored up heat nice in our program. cement floor and in that storage tank um, makes it so that we don't have to be running heat all the time, uh, a furnace all the time and we also could, if we ever had the, <laughs> the time, could go away for a weekend and our house wouldn't freeze. You know a lot right. of people that are wood heat with a fireplace or a stove you know, four yeah. hours after the fire goes out, there's no heat coming off of that stove anymore. Right. Um, and so this is a, uh, got a little bit more storage. So we do use wood heat uh, and hot water. For uh, your main For facility. our home and right. all our hot water for anything we use around the farm. I'm talking uh, about your taxes. Our taxes. Uh, well, the solar project will help um, because we were able to put that in ourselves. Uh, we will be able to take the tax credits um, towards our taxes over the next many years. Given that our farm, as we talked earlier, doesn't make that much money, uh, it'll take a number of years of, to use up the tax credits uh, because that's, um, that's, you can offset your, your tax liability with that. Yep. That's so exciting that you were able to do that. Yeah. Was it part of a grant or was it part of just your Well, there are farm grants you can get through the USDA to help with some of the solar projects. Um, we had not succeeded in getting one the last few years. Uh, we applied, I think, four or five years ago. Who do you apply to? Um, uh, the United States Department of Agriculture okay. has some grants for farms and, and farms across the state should look into that with the USDA and um, Rural Development Office. Um, our farm, uh, it's, it's a, once they've given out all the grant money, you know, we were just too late that year. Uh, and because I'm Lieutenant Governor, I tend to be a little wary of applying for too many grants. Um, even though it's completely legitimate to do so, uh, people, As a resident, right? I mean, well, yeah, but people will um, will claim that uh, you know I get grants that I shouldn't be getting, and I'm a government official, and so forth. And so it's actually one of the things that, particularly as a representative, I was particularly frustrated by because as a representative, you get paid fairly small amount of money. You were a senator for a long time, and yeah, thirteen um, thousand a year. Yeah, thirteen thousand dollars a year, which uh, you know to then make it so you can't apply for six and ten and twenty thousand dollar grants for massive projects on your farms um, seemed a little wrong to me. But uh, one can apply, but it's about perception. And, uh, and people um, will exploit perception negativity for political purposes and campaigns at the drop of a hat, which is really <laughs> unfortunate because as Bill, you know, um, we want everybody to be able to serve in public office if they want to and be able to run and contribute to their community. But sometimes if the economics don't work, it makes it hard on people. What, so, issues, what issues have given you the most satisfaction that you've worked on? Well, you know, the satisfaction actually comes years later. 
when uh, someone has bumped into me at a, at a fair or at some event that I'm at somewhere around the state and they say, you know, the work you did on medical cannabis has really impacted my life or a family member who now is, you know, uh, using medical cannabis while they're on chemotherapy and it's helping them have an appetite or maybe has alleviated pain so they don't have to take opiate killer, uh, painkillers. There are, when people tell me those stories about how the work I've done has impacted their lives, that's what really gives me the most satisfaction. Um, certainly, I put a lot of energy into our GMO labeling law and uh, was extremely thrilled when we passed that law, only to see it get cut to pieces by the federal government and $100 million of lobbying by corporate agriculture, corporate agribusiness, uh, which has now passed a law in Congress that's supposed to be a labeling law, but it's very hard to interpret. You can't read the signals if your phone doesn't work, which in most rural areas they don't. Uh, and it's really turned labeling into a propaganda effort where now some of the food companies want to see the label that Vermont created, which simply was a statement of fact versus the federal government's new label, which is much more a smiley face and, and all these things that it really portrays With a, pro, tiny writing. <laughs> a pro or a con when really the Vermont law just said, here's what it is. Yeah. You decide. Um, so that's something that was very thrilling and, and satisfying and then now very frustrating. But, you know, we've passed the minimum wage a few times while I was a legislator. We did it again this last year while I was lieutenant governor. Uh, unfortunately, the governor vetoed it. But um, that is very satisfying to try to move legislation that improves people's lives. And the minimum wage has gone up slower than inflation really since Reaganomics. And we're just trying to make it go up a little faster than inflation so that hardworking people who work full time and are paying their dues to society can actually earn a living that could pay the bills. I don't think that's too much to ask in a civilized society. What was the major point of the veto? Well, I, I can't really speak for the governor. Um, and, you know, there's different reasons given, but most of them uh, don't really uh, relate to the reality of people's lives day to day. Uh, and, uh, you know, they'll say, well, these are entry level jobs for young people. Well, the majority of people working minimum wage jobs are not entry level folks, it's women. It's single women who are helping run their households. Uh, it's folks in their later 20s and 30s who haven't been able to find another job that are paying their rent, aren't living at home. Uh, it's seniors. Um, so the majority of people working minimum wage jobs are not high school students, entry level jobs. Uh, they're people, that's their, that's their job. Right. Uh, so and community. they're having a hard time paying the bills. <laughs> yeah. um, so if they were earning more, that money would be paid right back into the community and would actually churn in our economy. What do you have to spend to hold your office? What do you spend? To the campaign? Yes. Uh, well, typically a lieutenant governor's race has been in the, for, for the last decade or so, has been $150,000 to $180,000. <laughs> um, my campaign two years ago was quite a bit more uh, because there was both a primary that all candidates were, were spending close to that, uh, and then there was a general election. So that race, it was about 150 to 180 in each of those two elections in that one year. Um, this time around, it looks like I'd be spending in the $150,000 range in all likelihood. And that's for your house seat? That's Senate. for the lieutenant governor's seat. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, and I have never taken, through all my races, any corporate donations and don't intend to this time either. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a different decision than some people make. But uh, I've never taken a corporate donation. And a lot of people don't do it for, for the same reason you don't. Um, some people. I wouldn't say a lot of people don't take corporate donations, but, but there's, there's some who are dedicated that do not. Certainly Bernie does not. There's some House candidates that don't. There's some Senate candidates. Uh, I know Senator Ash and Senator... Oh, I don't believe Senator Ash. I know Senator Pearson do not take corporate donations. They're up in Chittenden County. But if Sanders I know ran. Anthony Polina down here in Washington County doesn't take corporate donations. Yeah. If Sanders ran for governor, would think he'd have a chance? Uh, he might have a chance, but I'd like to see him run for president again, and I think he'd have a better shot this time now that he's got the base out there. <laughs> I lost my head. I should, have asked that. I should have asked that question. That's right. That's fine. Yeah. Do you want to talk about some of the projects that you've been working on for community building as sure. lieutenant governor? You know, I got elected as lieutenant governor the same night that uh, our president got elected. And um, in Vermont, he's the least 
supported president of anywhere in the country. So I think I can safely say that most people in Vermont had the same sort of horrible <laughs> night that night that I did. Even though I just won statewide office, I should have been jubilant. <laughs> but uh, but, but I, I could see what was coming, and there were two main issues that concerned me, um, the Supreme Court and climate change. Uh, and, you know, my daughter is 12, and I've, I've been thinking a lot about the Supreme Court, and especially recently with the next appointee, first the one that they stole, uh, and now this appointee as well, and how that's going to shift the courts around her reproductive freedoms, uh, the issues around corporate control of our communities and our, and our government. Uh, they're going to probably rule very much towards corporate uh, voices. Uh, they're going to um, rule on environmental issues away from our common need of a clean environment. Uh, and so I've thought a lot about those things. But, but a big piece of what concerned me about his being elected is really our democracy as a whole and people's faith in our democracy and our discourse in our democracy. And we're lucky here in Vermont. We have a very civil discourse for the most part and um, really work to bring everybody's views together. Uh, once the elections end, the party labels really should mean less. Right. And we really should be bringing everybody in. And so I started a, a movie series uh, sponsored by a range of groups from environmental groups to labor groups to civil rights groups uh, so that we would host movies primarily at the State House during the session once a month in the evening, welcome people in the State House from anywhere in the state but primarily central Vermont. But now we're taking the movie series once a month all across the state to really have discussions on provocative issues from we showed 13th which was about the 13th amendment of the Constitution and incarceration rates for people of color. We showed a movie called Made in Dagenham which was about women in the 60s who actually organized at the Ford Motor Plant in England for better pay in the workplace mm -hmm. and both union organizing but also about equal pay for equal work. Uh, we've had a movie, um, Awake from Standing Rock, that was about mm -hmm. the uh, indigenous peoples and uh, fossil fuel and coming together and, and really valuing long-term investments in our communities and, and many native communities that really look at what, they, what their decisions are and how they impact multiple generations. And they look right. to their ancestors and they look to their future uh, offspring many generations out and think much more long term than we tend to think in our society. Um, we've shown environmental movies around energy and the coal workers, both the coal workers in West Virginia and the energy issues of West Virginia. So it's not just about green shoes environmentalism, but how has the coal industry affected working people in West Virginia? So these movies are really all about um, bringing community members out to talk about the issues of our day and uh, watch a movie that, that really documents some of the things that are going on. I've also put out a newsletter to tens of thousands of Vermonters every couple of weeks during the session to talk about what's happening in Montpelier in a little deeper um, context than you sometimes get in the media. And I have people signing up for that all over the state all the time at ltgov.vermont.gov. And it's a one-page, two-sided uh, equivalent goes out electronically and people can email back in questions they have or contact groups that are involved with that. Did you bring one with you? I didn't bring one because we have very few hard copies. We do mail them to those <laughs> folks that don't get electronic media. Anybody who wants to sign up can contact the office and give us your mailing address. We will mail them to people if they don't have email. Um, I have a coffee hour every Friday morning during the session. It's actually an hour and a half uh, where anybody can come in and, and we have a discussion of three to ten people about whatever the group wants to talk about. And again, welcoming people with different perspectives so that we can hear the different concerns people have. People are so tribal now from party tribalness to you're for or against an issue. Well, oftentimes there's a gray area to talk about. And if we don't bring people together to talk about them, we're never going to find that area where we can find common ground. Uh, so those are some of the things. I even also during the session did a weekly FaceTime on, uh, on again, social media Half an hour, I would bring in people. We had youth from a local high school talking about raising the Black Lives Matter flag. Yeah. We had folks with Alzheimer's in talking about Alzheimer's and what's out there for support for people as they age and how to access that support and mentoring and community support. Uh, I've had people in about minimum wage, both talking about why it should be increased. And I also had a show for the folks who are concerned about raising minimum wage. So again, people could hear different perspectives on my program to find out a little more depth on an issue. So it's not just a, a two minute story on the news, mm -hmm. but a half an hour discussion about why the minimum wage is important to raise or what the challenges it might be for small businesses and how it could maybe be worked out. So um, really try to uh, create opportunities for people to engage in the system because more people need to engage 
not just the folks that are in the state house all the time and the paid lobbyists in the state house all the time, but also everyday citizens. And that's really been a big piece of what I've been trying to do as lieutenant governor. You go to conferences for lieutenant governors? We do. There's a few lieutenant conferences, uh, uh, conferences around the country every year for lieutenant governors. There's about four of them. I try to get to a couple of them. There's no real budget in the uh, lieutenant governor budget to go to many of these sorts of things. The budget for the office is, is pretty slimmed down. I basically have one chief of staff who does a lot of my scheduling, does a lot of my constituent correspondence, helps work with the newsletter and, and, and uh, works with our interns to do that. But there's not a lot of money in the budget to travel to conferences. So as lieutenant governor, as you were as a senator and as a representative, folks buy their own business cards. The state doesn't pay for those. Uh, we provide at the lieutenant governor's office uh, coffee or tea for folks and sometimes snacks and on Friday snacks for people. <laughs> you know, that's out of my pocket. Squash chips. Yeah, I think we <laughs> maybe pay some of the food for the coffee hour from the lieutenant governor budget, but it, I actually think it might be my own credit card that pays for that. So really most of it is, um, is out of pocket. So uh, it's very, so to travel somewhere and stay in hotels and spend, you know, $800 or $1,000, you know, I have to make sure that it's worth it for Vermont taxpayers to make it worth it to go. Have you thought about running for governor? Well, you know, this year a number of people said they wished I had run for governor, and I, I greatly appreciate the sentiment. Uh, it was really not in the cards for me right now. Uh, when I first got elected to office, I was a member of the Progressive Party as a, as a young elected official from Burlington. And being with all those different labels, young, Burlington, progressive, <laughs> I didn't really have in my mindset the idea of being able to ever run or win statewide office. And you I always- You believe that now, do you? Well, I've now won statewide office, so it's changed a bit. But the, but the mentality that I've always brought to the office, whether it was representative, senator, or even now as lieutenant governor, is that the people of that district, whatever scale it is, have given me the responsibility and the privilege to serve for those two years. There's no guarantee I'm gonna get another two years. And so I have always just gone full at it for each two years that I ever have, whether it's fighting on the issues of raising wages, universal health care, uh, you know, affordable housing, uh, end of life choices, GMO labeling, cannabis reform, sustainable agriculture. I am all in during the two years I'm in there. Renewable energy, I mean, I've fought like crazy for supporting converting our, our energy system to one that's much more sustainable and diversified. And uh, if that opens doors for opportunities because people are excited about those issues, great. If it closes the door and says, Dave, you're too far ahead of the curve on these issues, then I wasn't where the people were. But I basically take each two years as full on as I can with the responsibility and the privilege I've been given. And now you know that I've won statewide office, do I look at those other offices and go, if the door opens, which one would I most want to run for? I contemplate those ideas, but really, mostly I'm focused on my job at hand. And the most important part of the job, from your point of view, what do you enjoy the most? Well, I think in many ways it's a very boring aspect of the job to people out there, which is that moderating the Senate, being basically the town meeting moderator of the Senate, uh, is critically important because I want to make sure the rules are, are applied equally and fairly, that nobody can at the end of the day say, as a, as a senator, I didn't get a fair shot with my amendment or a fair shot with my voice, uh, and that, that any legislation that comes out of the Senate has had its full and fair process. And to me, right now, as our democracy foundation has got a couple cracks in it, and people are really wondering whether this system is going to work, I need to make sure that my role is towards making it work and making it work fairly. Um, I, I do think there's some real issues out there with campaign finance and that without public financing or changing away from corporate donations, we're going to continue to see um, the, the finance situation run Congress. And that's not my job as lieutenant governor, but it starts to feed into these races of corporate donations, the amount of money you have to run and raise to run for governor or lieutenant governor or U.S. Senate or Congress, it's just not right. And it makes it so that ordinary people can't run. It makes it so that people serving have to spend time raising money instead of doing the work of serving. And um, so I, I see a lot of my job as, as making sure democracy works and people are part of the system 
and that it's people's voices, not large money, that has the loudest voice in the system. Um, from that, I think there's tremendous issues to work on in terms of everyday lives for people and their, their ability to make a decent living, pay their bills, and have time for their families. Um, that's, that's what most people want. And the way we pay people with minimum wage, I don't think we're there. The way we don't have paid family leave, we're not there. The way we don't have universal health care, we're not there. Um, folks don't need a lot to be happy, but they need time. And if you have to work 60 hours a week to pay your bills, you don't have time to be with your family and raise your children uh, or visit your grandparents. And, as, an and that's older, the as an office holder, what's the most difficult decision you've had to make? N name, name one. Name a couple. Ooh, that's a curveball. That's like a debate question. I hadn't really prepared myself for that. Um, the most difficult decision I've ever had to make. Um, I'd say vaccine bills are tough because of individual liberties and my concern about the pharmaceutical industry versus the amazing good that vaccines do to prevent illness across our society and around the world. Uh, I think we've had tremendous scientific advancements with vaccines. I do worry that there's, you know, two, three hundred of them in the pipeline, some of which could be um, the issues could be addressed through better hygiene and better water quality and investments in uh, making people's lives better uh, and not always through drugs being injected into people that pharmaceutical companies are investing in and ultimately want to make a profit on. So that's, that's been a really tough arena of discussion for me. Um, but most of the issues I've worked on, my views are clear. And uh, when I run being very clear where I stand on issues, that makes it much easier to serve and vote on those issues. I have many colleagues who, who really hem and haw about an issue that they want to support, but they say, well, during my campaign, I wasn't really clear, or I didn't talk about that a lot, and so I don't know where my district is. I've always been really clear on sustainable agriculture and universal health care and raising minimum wage and climate change issues and mitigation and what we need to do about it. So when I have to vote on those things, it's not that hard. Uh, civil rights issues, criminal justice issues, it's not that hard. Uh, we need to make sure we put fewer people in prison and really address these issues earlier on in education and make sure opportunities are available because people are going to prison is really much more a symptom of societal problems where we haven't funded our education system properly or where we haven't trained our law enforcement to not have biases in their enforcement or where we haven't made economic strides to where families have domestic challenges because they're struggling so hard and then people suffer domestic violence and either the perpetrator goes to jail or the person suffering domestic violence then turns to substances to deal with their pain or to bury their challenges and those substances lead them to addiction which leads them to crime. I mean, the women in prison today are primarily uh, folks who suffered tremendous domestic abuse or have now become addicted to drugs. Those people should not be in prison. I mean, in uh, a so so all these issues are resolvable. Well, I'm just wondering, in a situation like you have, is there a, a place that you can see that you can inject, like a you know, a mentoring program for women with economic instability, right. and like provide you know how yeah. tos on small business and math. Well, and I, I think unfortunately. From a, from a policy perspective, Lieutenant Governor actually has very small role. I don't write laws. I'm not a senator or a representative anymore. That's the work of those folks. Uh, the, the top policy position in the state is governor. And that person runs a lot of those kinds of opportunities and programs that could be started through human services and other. I'm in the middle in this sort of no person's land. <laughs> but, but what I do have the opportunity to do is through programs like this, through the soapbox the lieutenant governor affords, through those newsletters, through the FaceTime discussion where I have people in. I actually had folks from Mobius and other mentoring programs in to talk about what is mentoring. Mm -hmm. And so if my position can help um, expand the opportunity for all of these organizations, you know, Alzheimer's support groups and mentoring support groups and drug addiction support groups to get out there so people know about them. Because right. many of these services exist and people mm -hmm. don't even know about them. Yeah. You know, there are services through human services uh, with uh, EBT programs and nonprofits working with them 
to expand your dollar, your EBT dollar, to buy local food at farmers markets I've and to that, yeah. you know farm to family coupons or women, infants, and children through farm to family coupons and seniors with low income through farm to family coupons to get healthier food. Right. A lot of people don't know about those programs. Mm -hmm. So if I can talk about those programs yeah. over and over, and sometimes I'm repeating Just myself, but it's different audiences every time. There, right. uh, that can really help impact people's lives. Through the programs that already exist, we don't always need new programs. No, of We course. sometimes just need to make sure people know about the ones that exist. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'd really like to see us do, and I've talked about it for years, and it's related to property taxes and education and educational outcomes and human services. The governor wants to flatline education spending. Well, the biggest place spending is going up is in the social services in our schools. But we already have a huge human services budget in state government. Why not look at the overlap between our school spending on social services and our human services spending on social services, blend them, reduce redundancy, save money for taxpayers, and create a better flow of these services between the families outside the schools and then the kids in the schools and actually have a better continuum of service for the kids. Right. We could save money and we could have better services so fewer of those kids end up in these challenging situations we talked about. The it's governor, I brought it to the governor, I think it's millions and millions of dollars, yeah. um, and he chose not to uh, follow up on it. And that's, you know, that's the difference between me and the current governor, and, and we're not running against each other. But, you know, it's important to understand policy as governor right. and really delve into it and use the office to go into human services and go into education and go into natural resources and dig down and see where we can improve services for people, mm -hmm. not just... Um, you know, cut taxes. Well, what's going to get cut by that? Let's save the money right. to be able to cut taxes. Let's make better programs so that we can save that money. That would be my approach. Mm -hmm. Sophie? Well, I think it's very, it's, um, it's timely, you know, mm -hmm. that you can look at it in that way because I think it's true. The amount of people incarcerated is ridiculous compared to the amount of people going to state colleges. Mm -hmm. it's, it's criminal. And, and the money that goes into incarcerating people that could be it's spent seventy-five thousand dollars per year per person, right. whereas your college education is going to be forty thousand max going right. to Princeton or some great school with the well, you it know, might be a little more than that now. Food but in a lot of a lot of cases, there's there's grants or there's low rate loans. But yeah, if we but, if I mean, we put money right. towards higher education, and we got some of these you know addicted moms out of prison and into right. treatment. Uh, we would spend less on them. Or just um, having And hope. prevent people even the right. option of going in. Right. Uh, which is actually what I'd like to do with our with cannabis reform. Right. Is put the first money towards drug treatment, highway safety, youth prevention for sure. Mm -hmm. But then any added money, let's put into the higher education trust fund mm -hmm. so that we make college more and more affordable over the long haul. Let's put some of that money, because we don't know what's going to come in. Let's put it into an economic development endowment so right. that we can invest real money in economic development. You served on economic development for years. You know there's no money. And so if we created a fund over the next 10 years that might have 30, 50, 100 million dollars in it, and we right. suddenly had two or five or seven million dollars a year to invest in economic development, think about all the needs that exist in economic development that you were unable to fund and support because there was no money. Let's take short-term windfalls and make long-term gains out of them, mm. not peter them away right. on short-term feel-good measures. Right. Sophie, any questions here? Well, I'm just thrilled that we get to have yeah. you to ourselves yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> this is really nice. Can we ask you, uh, let's get the last word then. How, how sure. do you want to leave it? Well, I just, it's, it's been a real honor to serve as Lieutenant Governor. The, the biennium is, is over and, and I still am the Lieutenant Governor through January. Certainly, I would love people's support to get back in that office. I think a lot of people are taking elections for granted. It's feeling very quiet out there at the mm -hmm. state level. A lot of people are looking at national level issues, and they rightly should be. But I do hope people recognize that we need to keep voting here at home, whether you vote for me or not. I hope people turn out and vote and participate in democracy because uh, low turnout just gives uh, sort of fewer people with a lot of money more power. And I would say whether you're to the right or the left, you know, Donald Trump's populist message was to a lot of working class people who don't necessarily want corporate power. I think they got duped by, by Donald with, you know, his tax giveaway to the rich and so forth. But, um, but ultimately, a lot of working people have been really suffering from a government that's not serving them well, whether from the right or the left. 
And I just hope they get out and vote, and everybody gets out and votes and participates. Final question for Sophie? No. Okay. I think he's got it. He nailed yeah. it. I think, you know, it's been wonderful to have a progressive thinker in a position of power. It's, it's inspirational for those of us on the fringe, I think. Hmm. And, and generally, um, it makes the State House feel more accessible for mm -hmm. the general public, which I really appreciate. And thank it's been you a big for part your, of my goal in the office. your energy you. and effort towards that. And Bill's done the same thing, just really, you know, reminding Vermonters that the State House is their house. That's right. And it's important to when I When I was first elected, uh, Michael Obahowski was the speaker. Mm -hmm. And he always called it the people's house. Yeah. And uh, some people think that's corny, but it really, um, it's an important thing to remember that we are public servants as elected officials. I like to call myself a publicly elected official. Whenever someone says you're a politician, I say, well, I'm a publicly <laughs> elected official. You can use either term you want, but one really con uh, puts forward a, a, a thought process that mm -hmm. I am beholden to the people of the state of Vermont. Right. And uh, I know many reps from across the political spectrum and senators feel that way as well. Uh, here in Vermont, we're very lucky. And I hope uh, that I get another opportunity, but it's up to the voters to decide. Yeah. Well, Sophie and I thank you for the interview. Absolutely. Thanks for having yeah. me. It's great to see you, Bill. Thank Good to see you. Absolutely. Thank you, Sophie. Dave, for joining thank us you. so much. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody.